Book One, Chapter Eight of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, Erasmus, his genius, his praise of folly, his Greek Testament, his influence, his failings but a man had now appeared who regarded it as the great business of his life to attack the scholasticism of the universities and convents and was the great writer of the opposition at the commencement of the sixteenth century reuchlin was not twelve years old when this first genius of the age was born a man of great vivacity and talent by name gerard a native of gouda in the netherlands loved a physician's daughter named marguerite the principles of christianity did not regulate his life or at least passion silenced them his parents and nine brothers would have constrained him to embrace the monastic state he fled leaving the object of his affection about to become a mother and repaired to rome frail marguerite gave birth to a son gerard heard nothing of it and some time after having received intimation from his parents that the object of his affection was no more he in a paroxysm of grief turned priest and consecrated himself for ever to the service of god on his return to holland she was still alive marguerite would not marry another and gerard remaining faithful to his sacerdotal vows their affection became concentrated on their little son his mother had tended him with the greatest care and his father after his return sent him to school though he was only four years of age he was not thirteen when his teacher synthemius of deventa clasping him rapturously in his arms exclaimed this child will reach the highest pinnacles of science it was erasmus of rotterdam about this time his mother died and his father broken-hearted was not long in following her to the grave young erasmus left alone in the world showed the greatest aversion to becoming a monk a state of life which his guardians were for compelling him to adopt but to which from the circumstances of his birth he may be said to have been always opposed ultimately he was prevailed upon to enter a convent of canons regular but he had no sooner done it than he felt as it were borne down by the weight of his vows recovering a little liberty he is soon seen first at the court of the archbishop of cambray and afterwards at the university of paris where he prosecuted his studies in extreme poverty but with the most indefatigable diligence as soon as he could procure any money he employed the first part of it in the purchase of greek books and the remainder in the purchase of clothes often did the poor dutchman make fruitless application to his guardians and to this probably it was owing that in after life one of his greatest pleasures was to give assistance to poor students engaged without intermission in the pursuit of truth and knowledge he gave a reluctant attendance on scholastic disputes and revolted from the study of theology afraid that he might discover some errors in it and be in consequence denounced as a heretic it was at this time erasmus began to feel his strength by the study of the ancients he acquired a perspicuity and an elegance of style which placed him far above the most distinguished literati of paris his employment as a teacher procured him powerful friends while the works which he published attracted general admiration and applause he well knew how to please the public and shaking off the last remnants of the school and the cloister devoted himself entirely to literature displaying in all his writings those ingenious observations and that correct lively and enlightened spirit which at once amuse and instruct the laborious habits which he acquired at this period he retained through life even in his journeys which were usually made on horseback he was never idle he composed while he was rambling across the fields and on arriving at his inn committed his thoughts to writing 
it was in this way while travelling from italy to england he composed his praise of folly erasmus early in life acquired a high reputation among the learned but the enraged monks owed him a grudge and vowed vengeance he was much courted by princes and was inexhaustible in finding excuses to evade their invitations liking better to gain his livelihood in correcting books with the printer frobenius than to live surrounded by luxury and honour at the magnificent courts of charles v henry the eighth and francis i or to encircle his head with the cardinal's hat which was offered him he taught in oxford from fifteen hundred and nine to fifteen sixteen and then left it for Baale, where he fixed his residence in 1521. What was his influence on the Reformation? It has been overrated by some, and underrated by others. Erasmus never was, and never could have been, a reformer, but he paved the way for others. Not only did he diffuse among his contemporaries a love of science and a spirit of research and examination, which led others much farther than he went himself, but he was also able, through the protection of distinguished prelates and mighty princes, to expose the vices of the church and lash them with the most cutting satire. Erasmus, in fact, attacked monks and abuses in two ways. First, there was his popular attack that little fair-haired man whose peering blue eyes keenly observed whatever came before him and on whose lips a somewhat sarcastic smile was always playing though timid and embarrassed in his step and apparently so feeble that a breath of air might have thrown him down was constantly pouring out elegant and biting sarcasms against the theology and superstition of his age his natural character and the events of his life had made this habitual to him even in writings where nothing of the kind was to have been expected his sarcastic humour is ever breaking out and as with needle-points impaling those schoolmen and ignorant monks against whom he had declared war there are many features of resemblance between erasmus and voltaire Previous authors had given a popular turn to that element of folly which mingles with all the thoughts and all the actions of human life. Erasmus took up the idea, and, personifying folly, introduces her under the name of Moria, daughter of Plutus, born in the fortunate islands, nursed on intoxication and impertinence, and swaying the sceptre of a mighty empire giving a description of it she paints in succession all the states of the world which belong to her dwelling especially on church folks who refuse to own her kindness although she loads them with her favours she directs her jibes and jests against the labyrinth of dialectics in which the theologians wander bewildered and the grotesque syllogisms by which they pretend to support the church she also unveils the disorders the ignorance the impurity and absurd conduct of the monks they are all mine says she those people who have no greater delight than to relate miracles or hear monstrous lies and who employ them to dissipate the ennui of others and at the same time to fill their own purses i allude particularly to priests and preachers Near them are those who have adopted the foolish yet pleasing persuasion that, if they cast a look at a bit of wood or a picture representing Polyphemus or Christopher, they will at least outlive that day. Alas, what follies, continues Maria, follies at which even I myself can scarcely help blushing. Do we not see each country laying claim to its particular saint? Each misery has its saint and its candle this one relieves you in toothache that one gives assistance at childbirth a third restores your stolen goods a fourth saves you in shipwreck and a fifth keeps watch over your flocks some of these are all powerful in many things at once this is particularly the case with the virgin the mother of god to whom the vulgar attribute almost more than to her son in the midst of all these follies if some odious sage arise and give a counter-note exclaim as in truth he may you will not perish miserably if you live as christians 
you will redeem your sins if to the money which you give you add hatred of the sins themselves tears vigils prayers fastings and a thorough change in the mode of your life yon saint will befriend you if you imitate his life if some sage i say charitably duns such word into their ears oh of what felicity does he not deprive their souls and into what trouble what despondency does he not plunge them the mind of man is so constituted that imposture has a much stronger hold upon it than truth if there is any saint more fabulous than another for instance a st george a st christopher or a st barbara you will see them adored with much greater devotion than st peter st paul or christ himself folly however does not stop here she applies her lash to the bishops themselves who run more after gold than after souls and think they have done enough when they make a theatrical display of themselves as holy fathers to whom adoration is due and when they bless or anathematize the daughter of the fortunate isles has the hardihood even to attack the court of rome and the pope himself who spending his time in diversion leaves peter and paul to perform his duty are there says she more formidable enemies of the church than those impious pontiffs who by their silence allow jesus christ to be destroyed who bind him by their mercenary laws falsify him by their forced interpretations and strangle him by their pestilential life holbein appended to the praise of folly most grotesque engravings among which the pope figures with his triple crown never perhaps was a work so well adapted to the wants of a particular period it is impossible to describe the impression which it produced throughout christendom twenty-seven editions were published in the lifetime of erasmus it was translated into all languages and served more than any other to confirm the age in its anti-sacerdotal tendency but to this attack by popular sarcasm erasmus added the attack of science and erudition the study of greek and latin literature had opened up a new prospect to the modern genius which began to be awakened in europe erasmus entered with all his heart into the idea of the italians that the school of the ancients was that in which the sciences ought to be studied that abandoning the inadequate and absurd books which had hitherto been used it was necessary to go to strabo for geography to hippocrates for medicine to plato for philosophy to ovid for mythology and to pliny for natural history but he took a farther step the step of a giant destined to lead to the discovery of a new world of more importance to humanity than that which columbus had just added to the old world following out his principle erasmus insisted that men should no longer study theology in scotus and thomas aquinas but go and learn it from the fathers of the church and above all from the new testament he showed that it was not even necessary to keep close to the vulgate which swarmed with faults and he rendered an immense service to truth by publishing his critical edition of the greek text of the new testament a text as little known in the west as if it had never existed this edition appeared at baal in fifteen hundred and sixteen the year before the reformation erasmus thus did for the new testament what reuchlin had done for the old theologians were thenceforth able to read the word of god in the original tongues and at a later period to recognize the purity of doctrine taught by the reformers i wish said erasmus on publishing his new testament to bring to its level that frigid wordy disputatious thing termed theology would to god the christian world may derive advantage from the work proportioned to the pain and toil which it has cost the wish was accomplished it was in vain for the monks to exclaim he is trying to correct the holy spirit the new testament of erasmus set forth a living light his paraphrases on the epistles and gospels of st matthew and st john his editions of cyprian and jerome his translations of origen athanasius and chrysostom his true theology his preacher his commentaries on several of the psalms 
contributed greatly to spread a taste for the word of god and pure theology the effect of his labours went even farther than his intentions reuchlin and erasmus restored the bible to the learned luther restored it to the people we have not yet described all that erasmus did when he restored the bible he called attention to its contents the highest aim of the revival of philosophical studies said he should be to give a knowledge of the pure and simple christianity of the bible an admirable sentiment would to god the organs of philosophy in our day were as well acquainted with their calling i am firmly resolved continued he to die studying the scriptures it is my joy and my peace the sum of all christian philosophy he elsewhere says is reduced to this to place all our hope in god who through grace without our merits gives us everything by jesus christ to know that we are ransomed by the death of his son to die to worldly lusts and walk conformably to his doctrine and his example not only doing no injury to any but on the contrary doing good to all to bear trials patiently in the hope of future recompense in fine to claim no credit to ourselves because of our virtues but give thanks to god for all our faculties and all our works these are the feelings which ought to pervade the whole man until they have become a second nature then raising his voice against the great mass of ecclesiastical injunctions regarding dress fasts feast days vows marriage and confessions by which the people were oppressed and the priest was enriched erasmus exclaims in churches the interpretation of the gospel is scarcely thought of the better part of sermons must meet the wishes of the commissaries of indulgences the holy doctrine of christ must be suppressed or interpreted contrary to its meaning and for their profit cure is now hopeless unless christ himself turn the hearts of kings and pontiffs and awaken them to inquire after true piety the works of erasmus rapidly succeeded each other he laboured incessantly and his writings were read just as they came from his pen that spirit that native life that rich refined sparkling and bold intellect which without restraint poured out its treasures before his contemporaries carried away and entranced vast numbers of readers who eagerly devoured the works of the philosopher of rotterdam in this way he soon became the most influential man in christendom and saw pensions and crowns raining down upon him from all quarters when we contemplate the great revolution which at a later period renewed the church it is impossible not to own that erasmus was used by many as a kind of bridge over which they passed many who would have taken alarm at evangelical truths if presented in all their force and purity yielded to the charm of his writings and ultimately figured among the most zealous promoters of the reformation but the very circumstance of his being good in preparing prevented him from being good at performing erasmus knows very well how to expose error says luther but he knows not how to teach the truth the gospel was not the fire which warmed and sustained his life the centre around which his activity radiated he was first of all a learned and in the second place only a christian man he was too much under the influence of vanity to have a decided influence on his age he anxiously calculated the effect which every step he took might have on his reputation and there was nothing he liked so much to talk of as himself and his fame the pope wrote he to an intimate friend with puerile vanity at the period when he became the declared opponent of luther the pope has sent me a letter full of kindness and expressions of respect his secretary solemnly vows that the like was never heard of and that it was written word for word at the pope's own dictation erasmus and luther are the representatives of two great ideas on the subject of reform and of two great parties of their own age and of all ages the one is composed of men whose leading characteristic is a prudential timidity 
the other of men of courage and resolution these two parties were at this period personified in these two distinguished heads the men of prudence thought that the cultivation of theological science might lead gradually and without disruption to the reformation of the church the men of action thought that the diffusion of more correct ideas among the learned would not put a stop to the superstitions of the people and that the correction of particular abuses was of little avail unless the whole life of the church were renewed a disadvantageous peace said erasmus is far better than the justest war he thought and how many erasmuses had been and still are in the world that a reformation which shook the church might run a risk of overturning it and he was therefore terrified when on looking forward he saw the passions of men excited saw evil everywhere mingling itself with any little good that could be accomplished existing institutions destroyed in the absence of others to supply their place and the vessel of the church leaking in every part and at length engulfed amid the storm those who bring the sea into new lagoons said he are often deceived in the result the formidable element once introduced does not take the direction which they wished to give it but rushes where it pleases and causes great devastation be this as it may continued he let disturbances be by all means avoided better put up with wicked princes than by innovations enthrone evil but the courageous among his contemporaries were prepared with their answer history had clearly enough demonstrated that a frank exposition of the truth and a mortal struggle with falsehood could alone secure the victory had temporizing and politic artifices been resorted to the wiles of the papal court would have extinguished the light in its first glimmerings had not all sorts of mild methods been tried for ages had not counsel been held after counsel with the view of reforming the church yet all had been useless why pretend to repeat an experiment that had so often failed no doubt a fundamental reform might be effected without disruption but when did anything great and good make its appearance among men without causing agitation this fear of seeing evil mingle with good if legitimate would arrest the noblest and holiest enterprises we must not fear the evil which may be heaved up in the course of great agitation but be strong in combating and destroying it besides is there not an entire difference between the commotion which human passions produces and that which emanates from the spirit of god the one shakes society the other consolidates it how erroneous to imagine like erasmus that in the state in which christianity then was with that mixture of opposite elements truth and falsehood life and death violent shocks might still be prevented as well might you try to shut the crater of vesuvius when the angry elements are actually at war in its bosom the middle ages had seen more than one violent commotion in an atmosphere less loaded with storms than at the period of the reformation the thing wanted at such a time is not to arrest and suppress but to direct and guide if the reformation had not burst forth who can tell the fearful ruin by which its place might have been supplied society a prey to a thousand elements of destruction and destitute of regenerating and conservative elements would have been dreadfully convulsed assuredly it would not have been a reform to the taste of erasmus or such an one as many moderate but timid men in our day dream of that would have then overtaken society the people devoid of that light and piety which the reformation carried down into the humblest ranks giving themselves up to the violence of their passions and to a restless spirit of revolt would have burst forth like a wild beast broken loose from its chain after having been goaded to madness the reformation was nothing but an interposition of the spirit of god among men a setting of the world in order by the hand of god no doubt it might stir up the fermenting elements which lie hidden in the human heart but god was there to overrule them evangelical doctrine 
heavenly truth penetrating the masses of the population destroyed what deserved to perish but at the same time gave new strength to all that deserved to remain the reformation exerted itself in building up and it is mere prejudice to allege that it destroyed the ploughshare too it has been truly said in speaking of the reformation might think it hurts the earth because it cuts it asunder whereas it only makes it productive the great principle of erasmus was give light and the darkness will disappear of itself the principle is good and luther acted on it but when the enemies of the light strive to extinguish it or to force the flambeau out of the hand which carries it is it necessary from a love of peace to let them do so ought not the wicked to be resisted erasmus was deficient in courage now courage is indispensable whether it be to effect a reformation or to storm a town there was much timidity in his character from a boy the very name of death made him tremble he was excessively anxious about his health and would grudge no sacrifice in order to escape from a place where some contagious malady prevailed his love of the comforts of life was greater even than his vanity and hence his rejection on more than one occasion of the most brilliant offers accordingly he made no pretensions to the character of a reformer if the corruptions of the court of rome demand some great and prompt remedy said he it is no affair of mine or of those like me he had not the strong faith which animated luther while the latter was always prepared to yield up his life for the truth erasmus candidly declared others may aspire to martyrdom as for me i deem not myself worthy of the honour were some tumult to arise i fear i would play the part of peter erasmus by his writings and his sayings had done more than any other man to prepare the reformation but when he saw the tempest which he himself had raised actually come he trembled he would have given anything to bring back the calm of other days even though accompanied with its dense fogs it was no longer time the embankment had burst and it was impossible to arrest the flood which was destined at once to purify and fertilize the world erasmus was powerful as an instrument of god but when he ceased to be so he was nothing ultimately erasmus knew not for which party to declare he was not pleased with any and he had his fears of all it is dangerous to speak said he and it is dangerous to be silent in all great religious movements we meet with those irresolute characters which though respectable in some points of view do injury to the truth and in wishing not to displease any displease all what would become of the truth did not god raise up bolder champions to defend it the following is the advice which erasmus gave to vigilius zuichem afterward president of the supreme court at brussels as to the manner in which he ought to conduct himself toward the sectaries this was the name by which he had already begun to designate the reformers my friendship for you makes me desirous that you should keep far aloof from the contagion of the sects and not furnish them with any pretext for saying zuichem is ours if you approve their doctrine at least disguise it and above all do not enter into discussion with them a lawyer should finesse with these people as a dying man once did with the devil the devil asked him what believest thou the dying man afraid that if he made a confession of his faith he might be surprised into some heresy replied what the church believes the devil rejoined what does the church believe the man again replied what i believe the devil once more and what dost thou believe what the church believes duke george of saxony a mortal enemy of luther receiving an equivocal answer from erasmus to a question which he had put to him said my dear erasmus wash the fur for me do not merely wet it secundus curio in one of his works describes two heavens the papistical and the christian heaven 
he does not find Erasmus in either, but discovers him moving constantly between them in endless circles. Such was Erasmus. He wanted that internal liberty which makes a man truly free. How different he would have been if he had abandoned himself and sacrificed all for truth. But after trying to effect some reforms with the approbation of the church, and for Rome deserting the Reformation when he saw the two to be incompatible, he lost himself with all parties. On the one hand, his palinodes could not suppress the rage of the fanatical partisans of the papacy. They felt the mischief which he had done them, and they did not forgive it. Impetuous monks poured out reproaches on him from the pulpit, calling him a second Lucium, a fox that had laid waste the vineyard of the Lord. A doctor of Constance had the portrait of Erasmus hung up in his study, that he might have it in his power at any moment to spit in his face. On the other hand, Erasmus, by deserting the standard of the gospel, deprived himself of the affection and esteem of the noblest men of the period in which he lived, and must doubtless have forfeited those heavenly consolations which God sheds in the hearts of those who conduct themselves as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. At least we have some indication of this in his bitter tears, his painful vigils and troubled sleep, his disrelish for his food, his disgust with the study of the muses, once his only solace, his wrinkled brow, his pallid cheek, his sad and sunken eye, his hatred of a life to which he applies the epithet of cruel, and those longings for death which he unbosoms to his friends. Poor Erasmus! The enemies of Erasmus went, we think, somewhat beyond the truth when they exclaimed, on Luther's appearance, Erasmus laid the egg, and Luther has hatched it. End of Book 1, Chapter 8